it's, it's like the old saying, I've heard it so many times, perhaps you have, have heard it, a, a person praying to God and saying to God, God, I need patience and I need it right now. Uh, he proved his point. I don't even have the patience to wait until tomorrow. I need it right now. And when we pray, that's basically the way we pray. We, we are not very willing to give God time. We want him to act based on our timing. We, we want it now. Why should I have to wait? Over and over again, you know, if we look back in our own personal life, over and over again, we'll see things that happen just at the right time. It didn't come too early and it didn't come too late. It came just at the right time. And it was because God was involved in your life and he knows the time. He knows something about time. And it's not that God is a creature of time. God is not a creature of time. That gives us a problem. We can't even get that in our, our thinking that God is not a creature of time. The only reason why God deals with time is that you and I are creatures of time. And you know, the sad thing is that this thing of time and the, <coughs> and the limitations we have because of time, we brought this upon ourselves. We brought this limitations on ourselves. <coughs> How many of you have got a cough? It seemed like everybody I'm talking to, got, I've been coughing for days and days and I've been praying impatiently for God to take it away and it, it hasn't happened yet, but... You, you, you say, what do you mean we brought this limitation of time upon ourselves? You see, when you go back to the time when, when God created us, there are all, all kinds of implications and an understanding from creation that when God created Adam and Eve, he created them to live forever. There was no such thing as death. De death did not exist until man foolishly sinned. And when he sinned, he brought on to himself a limit of time. He eventually died. You know, I, I find it amusing. It shouldn't be amusing. <laughs> Here, Adam and Eve were in this beautiful garden, this uh, utopian a garden, everything that they needed was, was there, perfection. And, and, and God said, you, you, this is for you to enjoy. You, you enjoy this, this garden and all the fruits and all, this is yours. <coughs> and then he gave them one law. Just one commandment. Just one. Wouldn't you think that we could observe one commandment? Just, just one? No. <laughs> There's something about us. In fact, when they broke that one, when Moses came along, he wrote 630 laws trying to take care of the one. <laughs> and even the 630 wasn't enough. It's built into us, this, this disobedience, this tendency towards disobedience. I, I recently heard an illustration uh, of a man who, who flies a lot. And he, he said, have you ever wondered when you go to the CR on the airplanes, they will have a smoke detector. You ever seen the smoke detector? They have these smoke detectors. And it says about this smoke detector, do not touch, do not tamper, do not, do not, do not, all kinds of things. And he said, I wonder why they just don't say, don't mess with it. 
don't touch it. No, you have to have a long list. Don't tamper with it, don't touch it, don't smell it, don't look at it, don't, 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 don't. Because we will find some way around any commandment, any law. That's just the way we are. <laughs> and Adam and Eve couldn't keep one. Just one, one law, one commandment, and they couldn't keep it and brought all of this mess on us. So here we are with all these limitations. We're limited. Do you know that we're all sitting here dying? <laughs> says, Boy, I'm going to get morbid here, you know. <laughs> But the reality is that because of time, we're just sitting here waiting. <laughs> and this has been brought upon us, this limitation of, of time. So waiting on God, and, and, and I don't know why it, it, Isaiah was so plain in putting this here. Well, of course, it was under the inspiration of God, but, but it says that, that, that God acts on behalf of those who wait for him. The implication is if you don't wait for him, he's not gonna do it. Sometimes we're gonna do it ourselves, and he just backs off and says, okay, go on. If you think you can do it, go on and do it. And of course we make a mess of things. But he says there, there is this thing of waiting. My goodness, there's so much in just this concept of waiting. You see, waiting on God demands our full trust in him. We trust him to act, to do what needs to be done in his time. And if it is in his time, it will be in our time. If it's good for him, it'll be good for us. That's what Romans 8, 28. You know Romans 8, 28. How many of you have memorized Romans 8, 28. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, that are called according to his purpose. <laughs> all things work together for good to them. It's in his time. And we don't like that. But Isaiah says, God acts on behalf of those who, who are willing to wait. But then he adds in verse five, he acts on behalf of those, he comes to the help of those who gladly do right. They not only wait on him, but they gladly do right. I like this translation, gladly. Sometimes I think in our situations, and I, I, would have, I know it from my own experience, sometimes I do right, but I don't necessarily do it gladly. I do it right because it is the right thing to do, but I may not necessarily like doing it. <laughs> you know, I can give you an example of I give you a lot of examples, <laughs> but but you see, here's an example. Have you ever wanted to take revenge on someone who has done you wrong, and you want to do something? You want to get even with them? You want to take revenge? But then you, you read in the Bible where God just says, vengeance belongs to me. You leave that alone. I'll take care of it. But, no but about it, vengeance belongs to me. It doesn't belong to you. Leave it alone. And we don't like that. Now we might do that because it's the right thing to do but we may not do it gladly. Deba? 
we don't always do gladly what is right. I want to get my own revenge. I'll do this myself. And you get yourself in more trouble than you were in the beginning. Leave it to God. We, we just don't like that. So I, I think he's purposely, he puts this word in here, gladly. It seems to be, we just run over that word. But those who gladly do what is right. And of course, the basis of it, underlying that is, is that we gladly do it because it's right. There should be a, a certain joy that we have in doing what is right instead of wrong. But God acts on behalf of those who are willing to wait on him. He acts on behalf of those who gladly do what is right. And he also acts for those who remember his ways. That's the last part of that verse, or in the middle part, who remember your ways. Those who remember. What, what, is, what are we talking about when we talk about remembering God's ways? We were talking about the ways that we are to obey God, the ways that we are to live our life, the ways that we are to obey his commandments who remember his ways. So God acts on behalf of those who are willing to wait, those who gladly do what is right, and those who remember who they are, remember that they are a child of God, who remember the commandments of God, who remember his ways. But then... The whole passage takes a turn. In the middle of that verse five, but we've done pretty good so far, but then we come to this but. You remember your English? What is this little word? What does it mean? Well, Here's what but means. That is a contrasting conjunction. How do you like that? Contrasting conjunction. <laughs> it means that it takes one thought and connects it to another thought. But instead of instead of waiting patiently on the Lord, instead of gladly doing right, instead of remembering his ways, here's the reality. But, here's what really happens. But, when we continue to sin, you became angry. You know, we stress, rightly so, we, we stress the love of God and that he loves the unlovable. We talk about the grace of God, unmerited favor that is shown to us, rightly so. And we talk about these attributes of God, which are tremendous attributes of God. But we never seem to pause to think that God might be angry about something. That really doesn't seem to fit in with our theology for some reason. That God would actually be angry about something. But we need to understand the personality of God. God can become angry. In fact, in, you, you go back to Noah's time, he became so angry with the entire world, the whole population, that he, he decided to, to simply wipe a man from the face of the earth. 
He, he looked at them and, and it says that when he looked at man's heart, he saw that their inclination towards doing evil was continuously with them every day. And he said, I am sick and tired of man. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I'm going to kill them all. That makes me uncomfortable. I don't know about you. I don't know. Of course, he created us, so I guess he can take us away. But then he looked down and saw one man. He saw Noah. And he simply says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So Noah was saved. He and his family, his wife and his kids, their wives, they were saved but the rest of the earth, the rest of mankind, because God became so angry with how sin was dominating his world. This concept of God's anger continues to, to surface as we read through scripture. Scripture. 